Hello and welcome to another Loyalty Cup discussion. Today we're discussing nothing. We're gonna go through a top 10 of things you might have missed in the house that Jack built. A lot of juicy bits. Let's jump right into it. Number one. So in the epilogue, when you see Jack on a raft with Virgil uh, going through the pits of hell, this is actually a reference to the Bark of Dante. It's a painting from 1822 from the artist Eugene Delacroix. It's a French artist. And basically the painting depicts a similar situation that's going on in the movie. They're going through the depths of hell. They're basically crossing the river Styx. There's tormented souls, bodies of other people down there. And I think the fact that Jack killed SP and took his red robe was literally just so they could reenact this painting within the movie as a really gorgeous scene. Beautiful painting, beautiful scene. Number two. This is the cat that killed the rat that ate the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. In the nursery rhyme that the movie is named after, there's references all throughout. There's even a movie that came out three years ago that's called The House That Jack Built. There's a Metallica song called The House That Jack Built. I didn't know where I'd come from, but it's a nursery rhyme that goes as far back as 1590. Interestingly enough, Lars Ulrich from Metallica is also credited in the musical section of the credits, as well as a special thanks. And maybe he's friends with Lars von Trier and just did some backup percussion for the film. You know, maybe he just threw him into the mix just because yeah. he likes the guy. They both have the same name. Also, in a past Lars von Trier movie, The Element of Crime, one of the main characters when she's first introduced is actually singing the rhyme, The House That Jack Built. Mm. So that nursery rhyme ties in in a few ways. Comes full circle for Lars. Obsession. Number three. So when Jack is toying around with Simple and ends up killing her, he actually mutilates her in a way that's very reminiscent of a real-life serial killer, Jack the Ripper, and how he mutilated one of his victims, Mary Jane Kelly. Yeah, and if you, you look at the images of how he chopped up Mary Jane Kelly, it's, it's brutal. She's missing parts of her thigh, her stomach was ripped open. She's missing Dis her juicy bits. She's missing her juicy bits, particularly her breasts in the way that it happens with Simple in the movie. There's also an Alan Moore uh, rendition of, of the Jack the Ripper story called From Hell. And looking it up, I, there's a page where the panels look like shot for shot what happens in this movie. Almost like a storyboard. Yeah, I'm wondering if uh, Lars saw this and, and pulled anything from it, or if really there's only one way to show a boob getting chopped off. Well, the movie's full of references, so I think it's fair to say that he sprinkled in a lot of true true crime elements. Number four. Tipple's escape is very similar to a victim of Jeffrey Dahmer, who uh, was able to escape, run outside, and actually hail down a cop. Uh, he was then given into the custody of Jeffrey Dahmer because he was intoxicated, which was a good enough reason for a man to be running around naked, underage. He was 14 years old at the time. Little baby boy. He, uh, similar to the movie, was then killed. Number five, Jack. <laughs> Blipping through those cue cards of just the things that are going through his mind, it's sort of stream of consciousness, mirrors the music video for Bob Dylan's Subterranean Homesick Blues. It's it's exactly the same shot. It looks right down the to the right down to the font. Yeah. Sean earlier was making the connection to just feeding into Jack's hubris of loving art, knowing art, being Mr. Mr. Sophistication. Number six. The director's cut. <laughs> Uh, shown in theaters actually has an intro from two of the participants in this film. You have Matt Dillon saying something forgettable, and then the director mentioning Trump, which is kind of strange. But after you watch the film, you'll kind of see that there is uh, themes of old uh, 45. He does ask for you to let the movie sit for a couple of days too, interestingly enough. That's a message that the typical film viewer probably isn't gonna get to see because they only show the director's cut for one day. Number seven. So there's a scene in the film where Jack is looking at a mirror and basically narrating this idea that to be a part of the society he's had a fake emotions and he's practicing different emotions he's seen in magazines and newspapers and interestingly enough one of the photographs shows a man's contorted face and as part of humor in the film Jack tries to make that face but the really cool connection there is that face is an old historic photograph in the 1800s where this neurologist thought he could reenact human emotion through electrotherapy so he would actually electrocute his patients and it teamed up with a photographer he would make photographs and this was around right when photography was invented so he felt the truth of photography could show these god-given emotions that was a universal language of facial expression Jack uses these concepts later on when he contorts the victims and he uses it specifically on Mr. Grumpy using metal to pull his face into like a happy emotion. So 
So I think it's a really cool connection built into the film. Yeah, it's a really warped perception of what emotion should look like. Number eight. Okay, so originally this movie was actually supposed to be a show, a uh, eight part miniseries. And the interview that I read, Lars von Trier said, I don't know if I could do another movie since I stopped drinking. Uh, I don't know if he could do another one sober. Either he started drinking again or he just decided to go ahead and make this a movie. Well, I heard it was also filmed partially so he could build in room for editing and then continue filming. Yeah, that's something he hadn't done before in previous movies, building in a break essentially to edit. And the film really does look almost like it's multiple small films. Number nine. So many people think this may be the last concluding film in Lars von Trier's USA Land of Opportunity trilogy. Originally, he was supposed to finish that off with a script called Washington that he never filmed. This movie takes place in Washington in the 1970s in the USA. Lars von Trier said he's never been to America, so these films are kind of just arbitrarily written from his perspective. And some people theorize this may be the third piece to that trilogy. Number 10. You know, reading online, I think people found this movie controversial because of the duck scene where you see the depiction of a duck's leg being trimmed off of it. Turns out, movie magic. And so when people reached out to PETA on this movie, they actually came out in support of it. And they said, while depictions of gratuitous violence like this may leave viewers sickened, it's true that serial killers, like the character in the film, often get their start by first torturing animals, making the scene all the more realistic and disturbing. They knew that this was just special effects, it was just movie magic. It's a dark movie. And that scene seems super controversial, but it's so quick too. I think it really just lends to the characterization of Jack and what leads him to the events as an adult. It makes total sense in the context of the movie. If you haven't already watched our uh, longer discussion of this film, I really invite you to. I think it, it was a really, it was a spirited discussion. And watch the whole thing. We bounce around a little bit, but we cover a lot of ground. So if we miss anything, if you have anything you can add, definitely hit us up in the comments. If you like what we're doing, if you love movies the way that we do, please click clack the subscribe button down there. Otherwise, I wish you and yours the very best. Good night.